Guys, we're finally over the calculations, at least the majority of the calculations that's going to be introduced in the course. You know, as far as equations and calculating concentrations and that kind of stuff like we've done in the past two modules, we're not really going to see the class turn in that direction anymore. Now we're going to focus on what we call standards. And with standards comes along some concepts that we probably have never seen before in any type of class up to this point. Uh, maybe a few labs here and there that you've taken with us, but as far as a general kind of mainstream lecture topic, uh, you've probably not experienced these before. So all of this information at this point is probably going to be somewhat new to you. Yeah, parts of it will be a review, but a lot of it we will go into more detail with and we need to talk about in more depth. So the very first thing that we have to say when we talk about standards and solutions uh, is the purpose of the calibration curve. Uh, we've probably done calibration curves before in our own Chemtech labs, uh, and you might have done it many semesters ago or many weeks ago, and you probably maybe forgot what to do or how to do them. And that's the purpose of this video. It's to introduce you back to a calibration curve and hopefully fully explain it and why we have to do calibration curves in the first place. So you'll get a better grasp about what's going on in a laboratory environment. So let's take a look at a traditional analytical laboratory. Analytical chemistry and analytical laboratory, that is a fancy word that just basically means numbers, okay? We're finding concentrations of things. We're finding how much stuff is present in a sample that's given to me in a laboratory. And most of the time, we have to use instrumentation in order to do this. Now, that instrumentation could be fancy, right? We could be using equipment that costs $200,000, 250000 or we could be using equipment that's just a couple of hundred of dollars. But whichever case it is, a calibration curve is always going to be needed. Right? The same thing can be said to a police officer on the side of the road with a radar gun. Those instruments have to be calibrated, meaning when you point it at a vehicle and it clocks that vehicle going at a certain speed, how do you know if it's working the proper way? Right? That's the whole calibration concept that has to be done with that piece of equipment. When I use a pH meter in a laboratory, that pH meter has to be calibrated, meaning when I put the probe into a solution that says buffer 7.0, I better get a reading that says 7.0 or something close to it. If it doesn't, then I'm going to have to calibrate the meter. I'm going to have to kind of make it in line, make it read the proper way, just like the very first day that I bought it. And we have to go through a series of steps in order to do that with. All right, well, the same thing can happen with a balance. The balance has to be calibrated. So basically what happens is that I'll bring in calibration weights and that calibration weight might have 100 grams that's stamped on the front. Well, when I put that calibration weight onto that balance, that balance better read 100. If it doesn't read close to 100 within a certain window, then that balance has to be calibrated. Now, calibration of an instrument is not necessarily the same as a calibration curve. They're similar, they go hand in hand, but they're not identical. So when I make a calibration curve, I'm not really looking at calibration of an instrument. I'm basically comparing the signal from the instrument to my sample or to my standard. I've made standards. Samples is what's given to me in a lab. Let's keep that straight, okay? If you make a solution in a laboratory, if you do it, that is called a standard. If someone else makes it and gives it to you and you do not know what's present, 
or you did not physically make that in a laboratory using reagents. That is called the sample. So what happens is that let's say I go to the instrument called a UV vis. That instrument is going to give me absorbance values. That's its signal that it provides. And let's say it gives me an absorbance value of 0 0.350. I don't know what that means. Right? Only thing it gives me is an ABS value. 0 0.350. The machine's not smart, people. Yeah, we might pay thousands of dollars for them, but they're not smart. They're not going to do your job. The only thing they're going to do is do what they were made to do. And in the result of a UV vis, it's providing an absorbance value. How much light does your sample absorb? All right. Well, if we take that topic and we think about it, if I increase the concentration of my sample in a UV vis, then my absorbance is going to go up because there's more stuff in the sample, right? There's more stuff present. If there's more stuff, it will absorb more light. So therefore, a direct relationship happens here. More stuff, more signal. That goes with any instrument for the most part. So if I'm running ion chromatography, if I increase the concentration of the stuff that I'm looking for, my signal will probably go up. If I'm running atomic absorption, if I increase the concentration of the things that I'm running, then my signal will probably go up. The same thing can almost happen with something as simple as a burette, right? If I'm into the process of titrating a sample, the stronger or the more acid or the more base or the more stuff that I've got in the titration, then the number of milliliters will go up accordingly. This is a common trend that we've seen in everything. The problem is that all of these instruments are very similar to something like a UV vis. They're going to give me a number. And it's my job as an analyst to figure out what that number means. 0 0.350 doesn't mean anything. That's just a number that's provided from me from the piece of equipment. That's it. How much stuff is present to give me that 0 0.350? That's what I'm after. That's my job as a laboratory technician working in a laboratory, doing some type of testing. I want to know how much stuff is there to give me the signal that I'm seeing on the screen. And in order to do that, you have to make a calibration curve. So what really does that mean? How do I make a calibration curve? Well, I make a set of standards. Uh, typically, you always need three standards. That's minimum. Minimum of three. With the standard set, I also will include what we would call a blank. That means nothing in it at all, just solvent. So if I'm dissolving everything in water, that should just be water. If I'm dissolving everything in methanol, it needs to be methanol. You get the picture. If I dissolve everything in acid, then it needs to be acid. It's just the solvent that you're using. That is my blank, and I should always include that in my standard curve. And then I have a minimum of three standards that I have made that has stuff in it. So the universal symbol for concentration is bracket X. So I've got a concentration. I know what I have added into that standard. And then in standard number two, I increase that concentration a little bit more. I make it stronger. In standard number three, I increase that concentration even a little bit more and make it even stronger. But I've done it. 
I know what I've added in there. Okay, well, three is the minimum. We encourage you to always do five. So I'm going to put a fourth and I'm going to put a fifth here. And the reason I'm going to put a check mark beside of each one of these is because we encourage you to have a set of five standards almost every time. The minimum that you can get away with is three. You can't have any less than three. If you make three and one of them's messed up, you cannot do a calibration curve. Sorry, you're going to have to do it all over again. But if you make five, and let's say that one of these is questionable, like it doesn't quite fit, you screwed it up. Maybe in the lab you added a little bit more stuff, or maybe you added a little more volume, or didn't add enough volume when you made that solution and made that concentration. If you messed that one up, then what happens is that we allow you to delete that one from the set, and you do not have to worry about it anymore. And you still have four good standards that you can use in your calibration curve. Or let's say that you screwed up number two. We can delete that one, and we can keep one, three, four, and five. Or if you messed up number five, we'll keep one, two, three, and four. Whatever the case is, if you make five and you mess up on one, and one's just horrible, it's a disaster, then get rid of it. You still have four standards that you can use to make your calibration curve with. In comparison to that, if you just have three standards and that's it, and you make these three, and let's say that you go in and you run them, and number two is questionable. Number two, no, it's messing your numbers up. And you tell me, well, I'm going to delete number two out of the set. I'm going to say good luck if you want a good grade. Because the whole purpose of a calibration curve typically is to get a very straight line. That's what we're after in these graphs that we're going to be beginning to see. And if you have three points and your job is to connect a line through those three points and one of them, let's say number two here, is out of whack. And we know that if we can get rid of number two, then we can get somewhat of a straight line. Any two points make a line, people. Let's wise up. Any two points make a straight line. So if you only do a set of three standards, and that is it, and you delete one of them, you're going to get a good calibration curve. You could be the crappiest employee that a company has. And if you only do three sets of or three standards and you delete one of them, you're going to get a almost perfect R squared value. Doesn't make any sense. You can't have just two standards. So play it safe. I know that it might take a little bit of extra time to make one or two extra standards that you don't need. But that little bit of time in the beginning when you're making all of these in the first place is nothing. Nothing compared to the time that's lost. If you make these three, you go run them. You figure out that one's not going to work, and then you go back and you got to remake them over again or add new ones onto that, and then go back and rerun it a second time or a third time or a fourth time. If you just do a set of five in the very beginning with a blank and you mess up on one, you're not wasting anyone's time. You run them on the equipment, you figure out, hey, this one doesn't work quite well, so we're going to delete it. You don't have to go back. You don't have to remake any standards. You don't have to rerun samples for a second or third time. Wait in line at the machine all over again. Who wants to do that, right? It's like going to the DMV office. You want to make sure that you have everything in place before you go because you don't want to wait in the horrible line at the DMV only to realize that you're missing a piece of paperwork. And then you have to leave the line, go get the paperwork, maybe from home, come back to the DMV office and do it all over. Don't make the lab your DMV office. Make sure everything is prim and proper before you go in the line and before you go and run any type of piece of equipment. 
Alright, so that's kind of the starting concept of the calibration curve. So in the next video we're going to come back and we're going to talk more details about the calibration curve, what should go into it, what types of calibration curves could I see, and how it relates to an analytical environment.